Now we can consider elimination reactions to be the treatment of a single molecule uh, with a reagent or on its own, um, but during the reaction conditions some kind of fragmentation process occurs and two or more molecules come out the other side. Now this invariably leads to some loss of saturation, so you'll put in a saturated starting material and you will end up with some degree of unsaturation in the product. Uh, usually this is in the form of an alkene, or a carbon-carbon double bond, like this. So there are three main mechanisms by which elimination occurs. Uh, the first one is called E1, which is elimination unimolecular. The second one is E2, elimination bimolecular. And the third one is E1CB, which is elimination unimolecular conjugate base. Now E1 and E2 uh, directly map onto SN1 and SN2. So if you've not already watched the substitution video, uh, I'd recommend that you go and do that now. Uh, we'll come onto E1CB at the end. So starting with E1, uh, the E1 and SN1 reactions have both got the same first step. It's the loss of a leaving group uh, to give us a carbocation intermediate and some kind of usually anionic species. This is the slowest step, it's the rate determining step, um, and therefore that's the key step in the reaction. Nothing else can happen until this has happened. Now, in an SN1 reaction, what we did then was introduce the nucleophile, which directly recombines with the carbocation, and we end up with our substituted product and our byproduct of bromide. So what's going to happen in an E1 reaction is after we've formed the carbocation intermediate, our nucleophile is now going to deprotonate the adjacent position. So rather than directly recombining with the cation, it's going to remove the proton uh, at the carbon next to it and push the electrons from that CH bond onto the cation, which forms an alkene, or a carbon-carbon double bond. So I've said that the nucleophile deprotonates the adjacent carbon. Um, that nomenclature is slightly uh, weird. Um, it's acting as a base, fundamentally. It's deprotonating something. It's acting as a base. But nucleophilicity and basicity are fundamentally the same thing. It's just that a base is a nucleophile that attacks hydrogen. Um, so you quite often will see the terms used interchangeably. So because the rate determining step in an E1 and SN1 reaction is identical, um, the intrinsic factors affecting the speed of the reaction are fundamentally identical. So the nature of the electrophile is the only thing that matters because the electrophile is the only molecule that's involved in the rate determining step. So the stability of the carbocation intermediate and the leaving group ability of X, uh, both of which we discussed in the SN1 video, are uh, the same factors which contribute to an E1 elimination as well. So in terms of stereochemistry, E1 reactions can give us a mixture of E and Z alkenes, although usually what we get is the E alkene as the major isomer. Um, and I'll just briefly discuss why that is. So if we lose our leaving group first, we push the electrons from this CX bond onto X, we end up with an sp2 hybridized carbocation, uh, which has an empty p orbital. And what we're then going to do is, when the nucleophile comes in, it could either push those electrons directly onto that empty p orbital, which would result in an SN1 reaction. But what we're going to do now is we're going to remove this hydrogen here, and push the electrons from this CH bond onto the p orbital, which is going to form a carbon-carbon double bond and form our alkene. Now, as it stands, this substrate here is going to give us a Z alkene. And that's because the two R groups here and here are on the same side of the molecule when the deprotonation occurs. Now, there's a steric clash here. So in this conformation, the two R groups, which are presumably large, or at least larger than hydrogen, are going to be clashing with each other. So this is not the most ideal conformer for this molecule to be in. Fortunately, we can rotate around this carbon-carbon bond, which then gives us a range of other conformers from which we can eliminate. So if we rotate around the carbon-carbon bond, like this, the steric class has now been alleviated because the R groups are both on the opposite sides of the molecule to each other. So that steric clash has been uh, removed. If we now introduce the base and we remove this proton instead, 
what we end up is with is the EL key. So because these R groups don't want to be close to each other, and this bond, as it stands in the, in the uh, carbocation intermediate, is free to rotate, it will do, and it will tend to rotate to the lowest energy form, which is this conformer here, which gives us the E alkene as the major product. But as we saw previously, it's possible to deprotonate from the other conformer, which would give you the Z alkene, it's just less energetically favorable. So E2, um, by contrast, is very similar to SN2. So both reactions are concerted. So the nucleophile, or the base if you like, attacks and the leaving group leaves at the same time. So here's our SN2 reaction, which is concerted, happens in one step. Here is our E2 reaction. So we can see that the deprotonation here and the leaving group leaving happen at the same time, all in one continuous concerted process. So key factors affecting the rate determining step in E2 uh, are very similar to what they are in SN2. So steric crowding plays a, a part, but now it's not the steric crowding around the carbon that's connected to the leaving group, it's steric crowding around the hydrogen that you're removing, because this is where the nucleophile is coming into attack, or the base. Uh, there's a new um, uh, factor here, possibility of orbital alignment, which I'll discuss in a moment, and the nature of the base, which is directly analogous to the nature of the nucleophile for all intents and purposes. So we can answer these two questions because they're fundamentally the same as the SN2 reaction, but we do need to talk about possibility of orbital alignment. So in order for an E2 elimination to occur, the hydrogen that you're removing and the leaving group have got to be antiperiplanar. They've got to be an antiperiplanar conformation. So here's a Newman projection of this molecule as it currently stands. So at the moment, the dihedral angle between this bond here, the CH bond, which is this bond here, and the CX bond, which is here, which is in the back of this Newman projection, is zero degrees, right? They're directly overlapping each other, so this is synperiplanar. Now, if we were to try and deprotonate at this position here, this CX bond breaking uh, needs the electron density from this CH bond to feed into the antibonding orbital, which is down here. Now, at the moment, this CH bond is on the wrong side of the molecule for that. So this process cannot occur in a synperiplanar conformation. So there's no E2 elimination as it stands. But we've still got free rotation around this central carbon-carbon bond. So if we rotate the carbon-carbon bond, we'll be able to find a conformer which will undergo E2 elimination. So as we rotate around, we eventually end up at antiperiplanar. Okay, so I'll start that again. We start out at zero degrees, which is synperiplanar. We rotate through 60 degrees, which gives us a synclinal or gauche conformation. We then move to 120 degrees, which is called anticlinal. And eventually we end up at the antiperiplanar conformation where this carbon hydrogen bond is exactly 180 degrees away from this CX bond. So now that we're in an antiperiplanar conformation, all of our orbitals are overlapping. So the CX sigma star antibonding orbital is overlapping with the CH sigma bonding orbital. So the electrons are free to feed in uh, across this gap here and our reaction can then occur. And what we end up with is our alkene, our base with a hydrogen attached, and our leaving group X minus. So if there's a choice of two protons on our substrate, um, and these are attached to the same carbon, so in this case we've got the blue and the green proton, uh, E2 eliminations can give us either E or Z alkenes. So if we look at the, uh, the sawhorse projections here, um, here I've got the, the blue hydrogen in an antiperiplanar conformation with the, uh, the leaving group, which is bromine. And here we've got the green proton in an antiperiplanar conformation with the bromine. So either of these conformations are reactive, they're perfectly suited to E2. So if we draw that as a Newman projection, in this case just to show you that the blue H is antiperiplanar to the leaving group, if we eliminate using E2 elimination, what we will end up here with is an E alkene. So we can see that our R groups are on opposite faces of the 
uh, molecule as it stands. Because the reaction occurs in one step, they will remain on the opposite faces of the molecule in the product. If we look at our other um, confirmation, where the green hydrogen's antiperiplane is the leaving group, if we do E2 elimination on this uh, molecule, the R groups are now on the same side of the molecule, and they will remain on the same side of the molecule in the product, so this gives us the Z alkene. So if a molecule has only got one viable antiperiplanar conformation, E2 reactions become stereospecific in the sense that the stereochemistry of the starting material determines the stereochemistry of the product because there are no choices to be made in the reaction mechanism. So if we look at the four stereoisomers of this compound, this isomer only has one viable conformation. There's only one way that you can arrange this hydrogen and that bromine in an antiperiplanar conformation. And therefore, E2 gives you exclusively this stereoisomer as the product. There's no other choices uh, to be made there. If we switch one of the stereocenters over here, so we've removed, we've uh, changed this from a wedge uh, stereocenter to a hash stereocenter, which has changed the stereochemical configuration at this position over here. There's still only one viable conformation, only now it's changed the ultimate configuration of the product. So in this case over here, our R groups are on opposite faces of the molecule, therefore they end up on opposite faces of the alkene. In this uh, confirmation over here, our R groups are on the same face of the molecule, so they end up on the same face of the alkene. And if we just look at our other two stereoisomers, we can see that the, the, starting, the stereochemistry of the starting material is determining the stereochemistry of the product. And in this case as well, the stereochemistry of the start material determines the stereochemistry of the product. And that's what we call stereospecificity. So back to our key factors, possibility of orbital alignment. So all, all of the orbitals involved need to be aligned for the concerted reaction to take place. And what this basically translates into is that your hydrogen to be removed and your leaving group have to be antiperiplanar to each other. So the final uh, elimination reaction is called E1CB, and you can sort of think of it as the kind of opposite of E1, if you like. Um, in this sense, the, the, deep, the deprotonation happens first. So rather than the leaving group leaving first and us ending up with a carbocation intermediate, in E1CB, the deprotonation happens first, and we end up with a carbanion intermediate, a negatively charged intermediate. And then in the second step, that anion kicks out the leaving group and we end up with our unsaturated product and all of our byproducts. So because the intermediate's anionic, E1CB only works on substrates which can heavily stabilize an anion. In the same way that E1 works on substrates that can stabilize a cation, E1CB you have to be able to stabilize the anion. Now this substrate that we've drawn is not a particularly stable anion. So if we add a group adjacent to this, which the anion can conjugate with, so somewhere we can push this electron density into, and that's usually a conjugative electron withdrawing group, we can draw resonance forms like this, where this anion is now bounced across two different atoms, one of which is oxygen, which is happy to uh, bear a negative charge because it's so electronegative. And this resonance stabilization makes this anion uh, quite stable. So these are the sort of substrates you will see uh, E1CB reactions occurring on. 90% of the time that's going to be a carbonyl, but it does work on other conjugatively ele electron withdrawing groups such as nitro because you can draw these resonance forms where you bounce this negative charge into a conjugating group and you end up with multiple resonance forms which is highly stabilizing. So the thing about E1CB reactions is they're capable of eliminating reasonably poor leaving groups. So hydroxide is normally not a very good leaving group. Uh, you normally can't eliminate it through things like SN2 and so on. Uh, but an E1CB reaction can eliminate hydroxide, and that's because it, this um, anionic intermediate builds up, and this relatively slow um, elimination reaction then starts to occur. So in these instances, the second step slower and becomes the rate determining step. And that's why this is E1CB, because the rate determining step involves a single molecule. 
Um, if you have a better leaving group, such as bromide, uh, E1CB tends not to be as uh, dominant, and that's because the E2 reaction now becomes much faster. So we said that you can't eliminate uh, hydroxide using an E2 mechanism, therefore the E1 uh, mechanism starts to, starts to contribute, whereas if you've got a better leaving group, you can just eliminate this by E2, and therefore you would never see the E1 uh, process occurring. So just to summarize, uh, E1, directly analogous to SN1, involves formation of a carbocation intermediate from loss of a leaving group. This is the rate determining step. The second step is a deprotonation using a base, um, which pushes the electron density from the CH bond onto the cation, and we end up with our unsaturated product. E2 is directly analogous to SN2, uh, so it's a concerted single step uh, process. Uh, in which the CH bond and the C leaving group bond need to be anti-periplanar in order for this process to occur. And E1CB occurs via deprotonation first to give you an anionic intermediate, and the second step is the elimination. And E1CB is capable of eliminating even poor leaving groups like hydroxide.